Fred, I loved your book on Wesley uh, on the Christian Life and Crossways series. Uh, one of the things that's most striking to me from our conversations about the book and from reading the book itself is this, this articulation of Wesley as the theologian of 1 John. Can you lay that out for us? Mm. Yeah, that's as close as I get in the book to an original argument. <laughs> that's right. And it even it's, it's not that I made the argument up. It's out there in the literature. I just think I've now written more pages on the subject than anyone else nice has. Nice work, nice work. Thanks, thanks. Um, yeah, First John's Wesley's favorite book, mm -hmm. you know, to put it lightly. Mm -hmm. um, he preached from it as often as possible. He cites it constantly. Mm -hmm. um, but more profoundly than just, you know, favorite books, it's, it's really the theological baseline for him. He, mm -hmm. um, if you kind of contra contrast the first John way of doing theology with the Paul way of doing mm -hmm. theology. Um, Paul's very much about an order of salvation and kind of laying things out and you get testimony of conversion kind of language straight out of Paul, mm -hmm. places like Romans and Ephesians 2. First John has this kind of strange, almost timelessness to it. Like what he's most mm -hmm. concerned to emphasize is that which is eternal has been manifested to us in time. We touched mm -hmm. it, we saw it. Mm -hmm. um, and that God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. And if you are walking in the light, then you are in fellowship with the Father and the Son mm -hmm. by the Spirit he eventually gets around to saying. Mm -hmm. um, um, and if you're not in the light, you're in darkness and that's the opposite. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Wesley really gets a hold of that as his baseline. The interesting thing about Wesley is that he also really loves Paul. I mean, he's converted when he hears yeah. the gospel right. from Paul according to Luther. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so he puts those two together. It, it brings some real tension and dy dynamism mm -hmm. into his writing and preaching. Does, does First John preach for conversion or is it more uh, something to preach for a renewal of people who are already in? Yeah, that's a good question. So it certainly preaches a vision of holiness. Mm -hmm. And if you're getting lazy and comfortable in your Christian life, mm -hmm. um, as you could say, the Anglican Church of the uh, 18th century was, right, right. Um, as Wesley himself was as an ordained minister and missionary. Mm -hmm. um, that vision of the holiness of God brings with it a lot, you know, a vision of the horribleness of sin, mm -hmm. uh, all kinds of things like that. Mm -hmm. um, Wesley certainly preaches First John for conversion. Mm -hmm. So um, the way I lay it out in the book is you can start First John saying, wow, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. How could I have fellowship with a God who is mm -hmm. that pure? Mm -hmm. Immediately, First John hits you with a couple of answers, propitiation and an advocate with the Father. Mm -hmm. um, and First John doesn't, you know how First John circles around things over and over again, these tests of our fellowship? Yeah. Um, First John does not circle around propitiation and advocate. Mm -hmm. It states it right up front, boom, it's over. Mm -hmm. And then you move on to the tests and the questions and the circling. Yeah, yeah. Um, but Wesley would preach it that way, I think. Okay. Yeah. That, that, that's kind of helpful to me. W will you talk about Wesley's contribution to evangelicalism. So, so partly you, you say, well, there's a lot of Wesleys out there. You can get Wesley the, the Anglican, Wesley the Methodist. You can get Wesley the one who read the Church Fathers and is sort of a crypto Eastern Orthodox person. <laughs> you offer us Wesley, the warm-hearted evangelical Protestant. What, what does he contribute uniquely to Protestantism, to evangelicalism in particular? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's that, um, that 18th century movement, that awakening um, that uh, he and Whitfield participated in, mm -hmm. um, and a, a number of other, you know, they're just the standouts, they're just the stars from this uh, widespread movement. Um, it is a, an internalization, uh, an emphasis on experience. Mm -hmm. um, th so that the warm heart, you know, that his heart was strangely warmed um, and that he experienced this uh, regeneration and justification and assurance of faith. Mm -hmm. He's, he's a little bit, um, he's not a sloppy theologian exactly, but he, he does tend to bundle things together without doing footnotes and letting you know what he has bundled. Mm -hmm. So he kind of bundles all those things together. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then also the, the part about asserting that he's a Protestant is there's a lot of loose talk out there about, well, Wesley, though technically he's a Protestant, really he brought us in touch with something much greater in the Christian tradition, you know, kind of Catholic or maybe Eastern. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you only say that if you have a constricted view of what's possible as a Protestant. Mm -hmm. And that's not how Wesley talked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I don't think that's how a, a healthy-minded Protestant ought to talk. Yeah. He's a particular kind of Protestant, too. He's a, he's a non-Calvinist Protestant, I guess is one way you yeah. can put it. He's a Wesleyan uh, yeah. Protestant. Could, could you say a little bit about Wesley, um, Wesley is an alternative to Calvin on the Christian life. Let me just put it, at, put it up as a competition there. What's, what does he bring uniquely? Maybe what does he do better than Calvin in his account of the Christian life? Hmm. Yeah, that's good. So there are some pretty obvious answers uh, that you would expect, even at, at the level of the, the caricature of what Wesley and Calvin stand mm -hmm. for. Um, 
I'd like to start kind of with um, how good Calvin is on the Christian life and how if you read him well as a theologian, really emphasizing the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. you know, starting at that mm -hmm. classic turn into book three of the Institutes. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing about Calvin and a certain side of the Reformed tradition is their high view of the law of God mm -hmm. and its ongoing binding moral nature. That God has the authority to command, that the Christian life has the form of obeying the commands of God. Mm -hmm. All of this is not by being justified by the law in any sense of the word law. Um, uh, but if, if you got that kind of a reformed teaching on the Christian life, mm -hmm. it lines up very closely. And I do some arguing in the book about how Wesley's really well understood as a Puritan. Mm -hmm. In fact, the surprising thing there is that he does all the things the Puritans tried to do and got put in jail for doing and got kicked out of the church for doing, mm -hmm. but he does them inside of the official established church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. Where Wesley kind of breaks away, I think, from what the Puritans had done, um, is uh, his emphasis on the, the freedom of, of the Christian, mm -hmm. uh, the optimism of grace that God can really accomplish in a renewed life um, a lot. Yeah. And if, if you tease that all the way back up into what his view of grace is, um, grace is not just free unmerited forgiveness. It is certainly all that, mm -hmm. and it is also power to obey, yeah. right? the gospel uh, empowers you to keep the law. Mm -hmm. Is there space, do you suppose, even for a Calvinist that's not going to want to emphasize um, human freedom as much, but is there space for a, a particularly Calvinist construal of this kind of optimism or, say, uh, hope in light of grace? For I mean, ca can a Calvinist have an account of Christian perfection? Well, <laughs> I was about to keep nodding my head and saying yes until <laughs> um, that last bit. There is certainly a space for what I call a, a nomophilic Calvinism, mm -hmm. right? A law-friendly Calvinism. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of it out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, people who we would think of as doing battle on the Calvinist Arminian front, um, John Owen, mm -hmm. um, who puts the L in the tulip, right, to mm -hmm. speak anachronistically, who really defends limited atonement. Um, he is so in favor of keeping the law and, and actually um, being righteous in, in the Christian life. Um, that, yeah, you could quote line after line from John Owen. So there's certainly room for that, mm -hmm. yeah. There's also room for a kind of Calvinist theology that does justice to the appearance of human freedom, mm -hmm. if I could put it that way, mm -hmm. right? There's another kind of Calvinism which says, um, you think you're free, but you're not, and until you admit that, you're in rebellion against God. Mm -hmm. right? Well, that's, that's a different way of presenting the doctrines of grace mm -hmm. than to say, yeah, you really fully experience the appearance of freedom. Let me explain why it seems that way to you. Mm -hmm. you know, the old Aristotelian motto that you need to save the appearances. Mm -hmm. um, some presentations of Calvinism rejoice in rejecting the appearances. The Tory Honors Institute at Biola University. Biblically centered, great books, liberal education. More at biola.edu slash Tory.